Went down the other day and got me a brand new fishing shirt. So I'm ready to go fishing. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> nice, cool fishing shirt. Nice, cool fishing day, right? All right. Well, we want to welcome everyone here to uh, our ministry, uh, Love You the Lord Ministries. Uh, our website is lyitl.org. We'd like to invite you to go there and check out our website. There's a lot of great information on there, everything from prayers to witnessing tools, uh, you name it, it's on there. So we want to encourage you to check us out. Uh, but let's go to Luke chapter 4, if you will. The question is, you know, did Jesus go to church, Brother James, and uh, why? You know, what was the purpose of it? And where does the scriptures back it up? Nowadays, I'm finding a lot of people are doing two things. Number one, they're either ragging pretty hard against the church because what they see going on in the churches now, because I'll agree that the church should be an outreach ministry, soul winning and discipleship. I've got that. And, but it still has its place. But did Jesus take and, and, and go to church? We're going to take and, and, and it also brings up a question, uh, uh, brother James, does it help me to be a better witness? You know, when I'm out in the world out there talking to people and, and, uh, I tell them about a local ministry that, that will lift us up and love us, encourage us and support you. And, uh, does that, is that a better? Yeah. People want to hear there's something substantial rather than just a bunch of words. So we're going to take a look at, uh, Luke chapter four and we're going to look in, in verse number 14 down. So let's begin to read, if you will. Uh, so in Luke chapter four, verse 14, and Jesus returned in the what? The power of what? The Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit. Now, if you go back to uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 1, we're not going to read there, but that's uh, talking about how Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. But now then, when he comes back from that temptation and everything, he was victorious over that. But verse 14 says, and Jesus returned. Now, where's he going? He's going to Galilee. In the power of the Holy Spirit in the Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the regions round about, and he taught in the what? The synagogues being glorified of all. Now, let's don't stop there. Now, Jesus is in the synagogue now at Nazareth, and it says, verse 16, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, underline that. He's going where? Nazareth where he had been what? Brought up. His mom and daddy took him to the synagogues and, and there he heard the gospel he, or, or he heard the word of God. And, but something happens now. And it says, and his custom was, circle that. It was his custom. For example, you and I, we have a custom today. As children of God, if you've been truly uh, saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and the God, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, then it ought to become a custom that we go and assemble ourselves. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 through 25. We should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Uh, as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much more you see that day approaching. Now, why is that important? Nowadays, we, we look at it as, as going to church as an option rather than as a custom. And the reason I believe that is, is people have slowly begun to lose their intimacy with Jesus Christ. When you were, when you first got saved, and Brother James, you and I, we first got saved, we couldn't wait to go to church. Couldn't wait to get baptized, couldn't wait to hear the word of God. And we got to where we said, amen, hallelujah, and oh me, amen. We really got into it. We raised our hands, we glorified God. Hi, Peggy, glad to have you. And so here in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is, uh, if you look at verse 16, and he came to Nazareth. In other words, he got up and he went to church, right? He came to Nazareth, which had been brought, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, circle that. He went into the synagogue, into where? Well, that would be their church for that day, into the synagogue, on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah or Elijah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written. Here's verse 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now underline this. 
because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. I want you to underline that. To heal the brokenhearted. Y'all following along here? All right. And, uh, and he says, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of the sight of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised or those that are wounded. Hi, Vanita. Glad to have you. And so in Luke chapter uh, 4, we're finding out that Jesus did go to church as the custom was. He opened up the book that was given to him. He found the scripture. He knew where to go. And he read that verse. Uh, verse 18, the spirit, which is God, the Holy Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. What is he anointed for? To preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, look at verse 19, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now then, as we find this, we know the Lord is going to come back, but he says, and he closed the book and he and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Circle that. So the habits and the traditions of the church are not old fashioned like some people tend to say it is. It's not a hand me down. Well, my mom and dad used to make me go to church. Well, that's what Jesus' mom and dad did, right? Thank God you had a mom and dad that cared enough about you and your soul that they took you to church. So you go to Sunday school and learn about Jesus, learn that he died on the cross, shed his blood for you so you could have everlasting life. Thank God you had somebody that wanted to share that, that information with you. But people say, well, it's old, old fashioned, you know, and, uh, these were traditions that were born out of necessity. Uh, please understand this. There are some things that, that we must always hand down to the next generation. I'm going to say it again. There's always some necessity things that need to be handed down to the next generation. And by asking a simple question today, Brother James, how can I be a witness in my own hometown. Now we know later on, uh, Christ is going to talk about that uh, in verse 24, he says, I said, you no prophet is accepted in his own country. So, but how in the world can I take and in my country, in my town, become a better witness for Christ? If all I do is, is go to church and open my Bible when the preacher opens his, listen to what he says, and uh uh, but take, maybe take a few notes and then I go home and I never, ever, ever do anything with that faith. I don't exercise it. I don't share it. Then I can see why people would think it would be a waste of time. But Jesus was very clear in verse 18. Let's read it again. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now underline this because he has anointed me to do what? To preach the gospel. To the poor, he has sent me to heal the broken hearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, deliverance to, uh, and, and recovering of the sight to the blind, to give at liberty them that are bruised, and the priest acceptable year of the Lord. Now that defies the, the local ministry of our church or any church, right? So what do we learn? Look at verse 16. Number one, we ought to go to church. The Bible says he went into the synagogue. Now, here's the problem today. Most people can recognize a fake. And people want something that's real. Well, how can I show the world that, that what we're teaching and preaching about Christ is real? What can, what can I do? Well, one of the things I can do is assemble with the ecclesia. That's the ecclesia means the called out ones. God has put together a place for us to meet. So when people come in and they see not just one person, but they see a handful or more people whose lives have been altered and changed because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it makes you a better witness. You're more believable. And uh, so but based on uh, verse 16, yes, we must go to church. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. Don't forsake 
the assembling of yourselves together. People tell me all the time, well, I'm, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I, I just don't have enough time. I think, Brother James, I sent you a little article. And uh, we spend more time on Netflix, not counting Facebook, uh, throughout the year than you could imagine. It, it, the average person will spend about uh, about 25 days uh, of the year just on uh, Netflix and, and uh, 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 not counting Facebook. And yet people spend less than two hours a week. But 25 hours a day versus 40 minutes or an hour on a Sunday. So that tells me that no one wants a fake religion. And if you tell me that you're saved and you love the Lord and, and yet you don't go to church, you don't sing praises to his name, you don't read the book that we call the Bible in front of you, you don't study it, you don't go out and knock doors, you don't tell people about Christ, then it's just another assembly in our city. So what does it boil down to? Lord has really been dealing with my heart a lot since we're going through this transition in our church. And I'm a firm believer that Luke chapter 4, verse uh, uh, 16 uh, and 17 and 18, especially verse 18 and 19, pretty much summarizes what we should be doing as the called out ones. Now that when people, for example, uh, I know that you and I were talking earlier uh, when people quit coming, they quit giving, they quit witnessing, they just quit. And they abandon. Whenever the disciples asked Jesus, when all those people left Jesus, uh, they said, let's go after them. He said, no, 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 no. Now listen, Jesus himself said if they were one of us, they would still be with us. So you focus on those that want to be with you, not those who left you. But whether you're whether you understand this or not, I hope you do, that we are required by God. We are required to assemble, to encourage one another, to build each other up. And you can't do that when you're all alone. So number one, you must go to church. Nobody wants a fake religion. Nobody wants a fake church. They want to know that it's real. But what's behind it? Well, the Bible says, and the spirit of the Lord was upon him. In other words, this assembly needs to operate through the influence of the Holy Spirit. Not just preaching, not just teaching, not just uh, 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 singing, but the Spirit. So he went into the synagogue. Number two, it says, and I believe that we must keep, he said, the whole, the Sabbath day holy. It was, uh, it was his custom on the Sabbath day. Every time that they had that custom, Jesus went to the synagogue. And yet people today so easily just blow the church away. And they say, well, it has no need. Well, you need it when you're getting married. You need it when you're going through, when you need counseling. You need it when you're possibly going through a divorce. You need it when you're going to die. But the rest of the time, we don't need it. You say, what are you saying? I'm saying, listen, folks, we need the influence of the scriptures and of each other every day, not just on special occasions, but he, he says he kept the Sabbath day holy. So the reason why we as Christians uh, come to church on Sunday, it's the first day of the week <clears throat> because it's a reminder that Christ arose on the first day of the week. It's resurrection Sunday every Sunday. It should be our custom to come and celebrate that. Most people only see themselves as, oh gosh, I got to get and go to church. No, we're coming to celebrate the resurrection of a living God, one who loved you, saved you, but you must keep it holy. That means it comes above everything else. A time that we set aside to worship God, love God, and just dig deep into his word. So, but it was his custom on the Sabbath day. Let me ask you, how holy is it to you that whether or not you go to church or not? Most people only see us going to church because it's not attached to God. If it was actually attached to God, knowing that God is holy and that we're to be holy, then there ought to be a holy time of worship. So you must, based on Jesus, you must go to church as the custom is. 
You must keep the Sabbath day holy. And number three, look at verse 16. This is amazing. And it came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and his custom was he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Look at this. And he stood up for to read. You know what he did? He opened the book. I know that when we got here, uh, you said, oh, I got to go back to my truck and get my Bible. I mean, I, I know people who come to church don't even have a Bible. They don't see a need for it. Listen, I'm telling you, you'll be, this is your manual from God. You'll be highlighting scripture, underlining it. Uh, and you say, well, what if I wear it out? Hey, they made more than one. But you ought to be taking notes and, and writing in it and highlighting it and, uh, and learning from it. Don't, don't be a fake Christian. Be a real Christian. A Christian is someone who's Christ-like. If I want to be Christ-like, if he went to church, I would go to church. If he was willing to uh, 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 to keep the, uh, the the worship day holy, I should be able to keep it holy. And then number three, was he, he, he was willing to, to stand up. Some of us need to, used to, Brother Jay, we were running, oh, we were 100 to 150, sometimes so close to 200 people. Uh, the first thing he did when I walked behind the pulpit, I said, let's please stand. Everybody would stand with their Bible open and we'd read the scriptures. And I said, why do you do that? Well, that's what the Bible says. They stood on a, on a uh, platform of wood. They opened the Bible. They read it. Jesus stood up in the synagogue. He, he read from the book. And, and so you, you must be not only willing to stand up, he stood up for a purpose. And that was to read the word of God. But in number four, verse 17, uh, it, you must be guided by that open book. Verse 17 says, and when he had opened the book, let's read it again. And there was derived unto him the book, or delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written. Verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. And he says, uh, and anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken and the hearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of the sign of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Nowhere did he say, I, I was called upon by the Spirit to go and just sit in a pew or sit in a chair. Uh, Brother Jane, he said, he said, I was called, I was anointed to do some things. So he, he was willing to stand up. Some of us may be willing to stand up for some things. Not only stand up for some things, but stand up against what needs to be against. But he says he was guided by the book. And then number five, he must be anointed in the spirit. What does that mean? Verse 18, he said, and the spirit of the Lord is upon me. So often, most of our preaching today is done by just notes. It's not done by an anointing. Most of our listeners aren't listening by the spirit. But the Bible says, if you're going to worship God, you must worship God in spirit and in truth. For God is a spirit. So we have to understand that what does it mean to be anointed? It's simple. To be in a, ceremoniously, it, it means to be set apart. Ecclesia, the called out ones. The Christian is ceremoniously set apart through number one, getting saved. Number two, through scriptural baptism. And number three, by honoring the Lord's Supper. And number four, by gathering for church membership. That was the purpose of the anointing. That's so that we could make a difference. We could have an influence. And then number six, you must share the burden of Christ. Verse 18, to heal the brokenhearted. Listen, if there's ever a time today that, the, that you and I, as the followers of Jesus Christ, should be willing to do more than just attend a church or, or be in a choir is to go out and heal the brokenhearted. There are people that are hurting. There are people that are broken. And Jesus said that was his ministry, verse 18, because of the anointing, uh, and because of the influence of the Spirit of God upon him, he says this, is that he's what? To preach the gospel. How many people today wouldn't even know how to, or where to go in their Bible to witness to somebody about being saved? On our website at lovingthelord.org, that's abbreviated, L-Y-T-L.org, 
There is the Romans Road. There's uh, 17 ways not to get saved. There's all this information out there that you could print out. But the Romans Road is the easiest. A simple gospel tract. Four things that a person needs to identify with and understand. Number one, you know you're a sinner because of Adam and Eve. And that sin has a debt to pay. And it's death. And that Jesus died on the cross to pay that sin debt. And number four, you got to be willing to call and ask him to come into your heart. So it's a gift. So once again, how many people today, if you were driving down the road, brother, yeah, you keep your Bible there. All of a sudden, God forbid, you came across a car wreck and somebody's gasping for air. They're about to die. They're going to go out to eternity, but you can't grab your Bible. You don't have time to flip through the pages. You should have the word of God memorized in your heart. So you can begin to explain to that person how that Jesus died for them, loved them, and would they like to accept him as their Lord and Savior. You see, there's you know, the, the seventh thing was, is not only was he anointed, in other words, he was, the Holy Spirit of God guided him. How many times during the day I have a thought about a person. I was thinking about a friend of mine uh, the other day. And uh, his name is Ricky. And uh, he's been a real good friend for years and years and years. And, and just his, his, his face popped into my mind. And so I understand about spiritual promptings. And I thought, you know, I need to call him. And I, 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 I need to do it today. But if I don't write it down, guess what I do? I forget, right? And so uh, all of a sudden in the afternoon, my phone rings. And Ricky calls me and leaves me a message. I wasn't near my phone to, to get it. But as soon as I got that message, I said, okay, that's two right there. Number one, his face popped into, into my mind. Number two, I get a phone call. I, I immediately, going down the road, I called. Put my earpiece in, I called. And I said, I just want to check on you. He said, I'll just call and check on you. But see, you never know. That might have been the last prompting that I could have ever had with him. Now, he's saved, knows the Lord, loves the Lord. And, but, you know, it was important that we had that conversation just to let each other know that, it, that it's going to be okay. We're in this world together. All right? And uh, so, once again, if, I want you to become aware of the spiritual promptings. In fact, when it comes time for church, it'll be a custom, not a prompting. It's, it's something you do regularly on a regular basis because the Word of God has taught it, you've done it, and, and, and you want to be faithful to it. But what does he say here? So, uh, Jesus teaches, verse 16, we must go to church. Verse uh, uh, 16, that we must keep the day holy. And uh, we must be willing to stand up, verse 16, verse 17. We must be guided by the book, verse 18. And we must be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to give us promptings to be used of God. And then, verse 18, you must share the burden, the burden of Christ. What was this burden? Well, let's go back and read it in case you and I missed it. Verse 18, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. In other words, the influence of God, the Holy Spirit was on him. He says, because he has anointed me. And when you anoint someone, you anoint them for a purpose to do a service for God to get results. He said, he anointed me to do what? To preach the gospel. And then to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Did you get that? Our first thing we should learn as a child of God is how to win somebody to Jesus Christ. And if you haven't learned that, I would suggest you go to our website, download the information, and you write it in the front of your Bible, print it out, put it there, but make sure you have it handy. I'd have 10 or 15 of these laying around, Brother Jay, in my car. So if I had to, I could always pull it out and hand it to somebody. Why? He said, because that's the anointing. And anointing is, that's the purpose the question is, do you feel like you're anointed? Do you feel like you're being led by the Holy Spirit of God? All right? And so, and what was the purpose? To share the burden of Christ. Even to the brokenhearted, he said. And so, uh, number uh, seven, you must stand up under scrutiny. Let's look at, let's go on down a little bit. Verse 19, the priest, the acceptable year of the Lord, that God's coming back. Verse 20, and he closed the book. And he gave it again to the minister and he sat down. 
And the eyes of them that were in the synagogue, look at this, were fastened on him. How many know when you walk into a room and everybody's looking at you, you got to know it, right? All Jesus did was open up to the right scripture at the right time, talking to the right people. And, and here's what he did, Lonnie, glad to see you. So in Luke chapter 4, uh, did Jesus, uh, was it his custom to go to the synagogue to hear the word of God? Yes. But this time he stood up and he, when they had, when the minister handed God, <laughs> when the minister handed the book over to God, God Jesus knew right where to go, what to read, and it, it began to prick their hearts. You see, if all we do is have the goody two shoe sermons, uh, uh, Brother James, that's not going to work after a while. I mean, if you want a motivational sermon, uh, just motivational, YouTube's full of them. But if you want to be under the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God, the anointing of God, when it's preached under the anointing of God, when the Word of God, which is the anointed Word of God, and when the anointed God Himself is in the room, it's going to prick some hearts. It's going to stir some things up. People have asked me, will the church ever see revival again? And I'm telling you, it's not about the local church buildings. The answer is, do I want revival? Do I personally want to let the Spirit of God revive me, to set me back on fire, to preach the way we ought to preach, and to love the way we ought to love, and to heal the way we ought to heal, and do the things that God has called us to do, not asking God just to bless what we want to do. But we must be willing to share the burden. Share the burden. But even Jesus stood up under scrutiny. And I think today that a lot of people don't realize is that when you and I are in, uh, we go to church, people are going to make fun of you. They're going to think it's foolish. But to the saved, it's not because we're in the presence of God. And there's something about going and hearing the preacher preach and all of a sudden you feel the Spirit of God just touching you and saying, that's an area of my life that's wrong and I need to get it right. There's sin in my life and I need to deal with that. And I believe that sin will always keep you from wanting to do the right thing. And that's what we call righteousness. But I believe that righteousness in our life will help us to become victorious over our sin. So I, I remember not too long ago that Brother James, a preacher, was preaching and he, he said, he said he's saved now and he has no sin. And I understand what he means is that, that because his, his soul is saved, his spirit is saved, that the eyes of God, God doesn't see that part of you as sinful. But even the apostle Paul says, he says that I want to do, I don't do, and that I don't want to do. That's what I wind up doing. I find a law that sin reigns in my mortal body. First John tells us that if we confess our sin, he's willing, faithful, and just to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So just because you're saved, your body's not saved. Your body's still carnal. And that's why Paul says, I find a law that, I, that I, my body rages against my spirit. My spirit rages against my body to do what is right. So what is the church? Let me give you our definition. If you go to what we believe on our website at lyitl.org, click on what we believe. There is a PDF there that you can download. And you'll go to uh, the part where it says, of the church. Let me read this to you. We believe that a Baptist church, or any church, is a congregation of baptized believers associated by a covenant of faith and fellowship. Did you get that? Faith and fellowship. Of the gospel. The said church being understood to be the citadel and the propagator of the divine eternal grace. Observing the ordinances of Christ. 
which would be baptism and the Lord's Supper, governed by his laws, exercising the gifts, the rights, and the privileges invested in them by his word. That is officers of ordination or pastors of elders whose qualifications, claims, and duties are clearly defined in the scriptures. We believe the true mission of the church is found in the Great Commission. If I was asked the average person, Brother James, where's the Great Commission in the Bible? I know you would tell me Matthew 28. Most people don't know that. But we are commanded to go out and win people to Christ, help them to identify through baptism and church attendance and make disciples out of them. So, but we're commanded uh, to make individual disciples and then we're to build each other up. Two things. Well, let me give you three. The church, number one, is to make individual disciples. You do that by getting somebody saved, get them out of the word of God, train them in the ways of Christ. Number two, to build them up. That means to be there. Uh, we were talking about how many people have abandoned so many ministries, including ours over time. But to build up the church, does that mean to put more people in this building? Well, that'd be wonderful, but, but the church. So you have to ask yourself, what am I doing to build up the people that I call my church family? And number three, to teach and instruct as he's commanded. In fact, when you read this, it says, we do not believe in the reversal of this order. We hold that the local church has the absolute right of self-government. It's called local uh, autonomy, autonomy, free from the interference of any hierarchy of individual organizations, and that the one and only superintendent is Christ through the Holy Spirit that is scriptural for true churches, true churches to cooperate with each other in contending for the faith and for the furtherance of the gospel. That every church is the sole and only judge of the measure and the method of its cooperation and on all matters of membership, of policy government, of discipline, of benevolence, the will of the local church is final. So we have it laid out. There's no excuse uh, why we shouldn't understand the value of this ministry. In fact, Paul later on says, hi, Starla, hi, Kayla, uh, Catherine and James. Uh, so people will downplay they say, well, I don't need to go to church anymore. I don't need to be part of something. But you do. Why is that? Because we believe that the Bible believe in Baptist is one who, listen, believes in a supernatural Bible, which tells of a supernatural Christ who had a supernatural birth, who spoke supernatural words, who performed supernatural miracles, who lived a supernatural life, who died a supernatural death, who rose in supernatural power who is seated in supernatural splendor, who intercedes as a supernatural priest, who will one day return in supernatural glory to establish a supernatural kingdom on this earth. And what does that mean? Well, if you go back and read the book of Revelation, Brother James, everything that we know as reality, the heavens of heavens, the heavens and, and the earth, well, this earth will melt away in fervent heat. Nothing will be left. And God will create a new heaven and a new earth. And that's where he will be our God, we will be his people, and we'll live together for eternity. So the bottom line is this. And I, I, it's not about the length of time that we're preaching today. What it is, is did you get anything out of the time that we preached? Did anything touch your heart? Did it make you realize of our obligations that we, yes, we should be going to the church and assembling. And yes, we should be keeping the, the day, uh, that's why Sunday for us, absolutely holy. And we must be willing to stand up. We must be guided by the book and we must be anointed of the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. And we must share the burden of Jesus Christ. And yes, we're going to stand under scrutiny. People are going to point their fingers at you. But I'd rather take and, and people have people point their fingers at me today and to have Jesus point his fingers at me, saying, what did you do with it? So let me ask you this. Hi, good to see you. What have you done with the life that God gave you? Seriously. You say, well, I work. You talked about earlier. What do you do? I get up, go to work. I work all day. I come home. Did you enjoy the life that God gave you? Did you enjoy what he's done? 
for you? And have you made the importance of just making money the main issue of life? That's not life. That's not living. We talked about earlier that got, uh, Lady Karen got me a new fishing shirt. Doesn't do me any good if I don't go fishing. So we talked about going fishing. What, what have you done with the life I gave you? Did you have fun? Did you simplify it? I mean, is it to the point where you don't know if you want to live this life anymore? Well, here's the deal. I suggest that you begin to meditate a little bit. Uh, the other day, I, I went out and got a, a folding chair and put it on my front porch. And after I was cleaning the yard, and I just sat down and, and I just meditated. I looked at that. And I began to ask myself, uh, Lynn, I mean, what have I done with my life? What am I doing now with my life? Did, am I enjoying what God's given me? Have I gotten so complicated that it's all about just making enough money to pay the bills? Or have I made a difference? I know as a Christian, I ought to be witnessing more and talking to more people. But as an individual Christian, also be, even Jesus took time to, to, uh, to sit down and talk and, and go for walks with his people. What about you? When was the time you just meditated, cleared your head, cleared your heart and said, what have I done with my life? What am I doing with my life? Is it going to make a difference? I hope and pray that you'll take to heart what we talked about today. Go back and re-listen. Share this with somebody. But three things as, as called out people, Ecclesia, is we're to make individual disciples, we're to build each other up, and we're to teach and instruct as he has commanded. Have I, have I done that with my family? Have I done that with my friends? Have I done that with my coworkers? Am I doing that today? How am I operating on a personal level? I hope and pray that maybe you'll take some time out to meditate today and just look at your life and decide what is it, what's it going to take to be able to get rid of the pressure? What's it going to take to be able to make you happy again? What's it going to take to make you smile and laugh? What's it going to take to make you want to dance again? I hope you'll just start over today, simplify some things, specify some things, and then act upon those. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you that you've given us life. But Father, we've gotten so complicated. We've allowed the complication to just totally take away our breath. Help us to breathe again. Help us to let go of the things that no longer be, need to be held on to. Help us to start today afresh and new and to start the day under the anointing, the influence of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Help us to be a witness when, when that opportunity opens up. And we just pray, 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 pray for people who are lost to actually hear the gospel and build what the Jesus that hopefully they see in all of us. So, Father, I pray, help us from this moment on to be real Christians, not fake ones, to be the real called out ones, not just going to a church, but, Lord, to be the church. Lord Jesus, if there's anyone here that's listening that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, I would pray that it'd be like the thief on the cross, realizing that they're lost in need of a Savior, and then look to you and ask you, would you remember me when thou goest in thy kingdom? And as you told the thief on the cross today, Lord, I pray that today that someone will say, Lord Jesus, pray it out loud. I know I'm a sinner. I know that you're the Savior and that you died for me. Shed your blood for me. And you arose on the third day, and you're alive right now. So I'm asking you, Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to think right, to love right, and to live right. 
that I might be able to influence others to accept you as their Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me. Thank you for anointing me and thank you for going, that you're going to guide me every day. I love you. Hugs and kisses in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. See y'all tonight. See.